and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. Welcome to tonight's Grace Study Hour webinar. I am your host, Charles Smoot, author of Fallen from Grace. Understanding the Theology of Grace, the Dangers of Legalism, and the Three Phases of Apostasy, which is now available in both paperback and Kindle edition at Amazon.com. Folks, we're happy to uh, have you join us this evening for our last webinar in this series entitled Fallen from Grace and we are bringing part three of chapter 17 entitled The Grace Factor. Grab your favorite chair, grab your favorite beverage, and grab a notebook and a pen. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, we're going to go ahead and get right into our material this evening. Part three, the grace factor. I'm looking for a city. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth and so ladies and gentlemen we find as the descendants of noah uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, as they uh, found this place in the land of Shinar, they left off doing what God had commanded them to do and began to devise their own scheme. Continuing on in the book of Genesis, by faith, actually the book of Hebrews, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11 verses 8 through 10. Shortly after the flood, Noah's descendants gathered in the land of Shinar, but they gathered there in disobedience and in defiance against the God of heaven. With bricks and slime, they set out to build a city and a tower, quote, whose top 
may reach unto heaven, unquote. It later became known as the Tower of Babel. With Nimrod as their ruler, Babel, or Babylon, was intended to become the political, commercial, and religious center of the world. You see, originally Babel meant, quote, the gate of God, unquote. Nimrod intended Babel to become the gate of God or the entryway to heaven. However, to put an end to this rebellion against his command to repopulate the whole earth, the scripture says, God came down, confounded their language, and scattered them so that they would fulfill his will. Since then, Babel has come to mean confusion. This, ladies and gentlemen, illustrates the truth that one, legalism is nothing more than the effort of man climbing up, trying to save himself. While, on the other hand, grace is God coming down to save man from himself. You see, ladies and gentlemen, in this great redemptive message that we share with the world, we are essentially declaring that legalism or the concept of righteousness through human merit is nothing more than man's feeble attempt to try to save himself. You see, legalism, ladies and gentlemen, is any belief system or any religious system whereby man derives merit through the keeping of the law or other man-made doctrines, disciplines, or rules in order that he might obtain righteousness with God and thereby secure for himself favor, blessings, and in the end, salvation and eternal life. You see, legalism, ladies and gentlemen, is man's best efforts to save himself. While grace again, is God coming down or God coming to man to save man from himself. And so grace is the free gift of God's unmerited favor that brings with it a divine benefit of a sort to undeserving people to help them during a time of need. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, through grace, God came down to save man from himself. And that is from the his inability to obtain righteousness through his own merit. You see, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. He goes on to say in verse 9 of John chapter 10, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in 
and out and find pasture. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it is only through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone that we can receive freely that which we cannot achieve or accomplish in our own stead. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ alone is the door or the gate to heaven. And we are asserting in this series of webinars that it is only through faith in Christ who he is and what he has done on our behalf that brings us into a right relationship with our Heavenly Father. The Bible is written in the spirit of redemption. It is about the redemption of man from the curse of sin and death. It is about the drama and the process of that redemption. You see, the grace of God that brings salvation to us is fully expressed in God's love and in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus Legalism, ladies and gentlemen, is a deadly and a toxic poison within the bloodstream of the body of Christ. However, when we get right down to it, ladies and gentlemen, legalism is nothing more than religious humanism. This means nothing less than that man becomes his own savior. You see, legalism is simply man striving to be saved and striving to reach or obtain heaven through the merit of his own performance or his own effort. You see, legalism depends on what you can do, while grace depends upon what God has already done in your behalf. Now, in addressing legalism in the church at Galatia, the Apostle Paul said this in Galatians 3 and verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Well said, Paul, because it is foolish to practice the craft of righteousness through works or through human merit. Ladies and gentlemen, let there be no misunderstanding. Let there be no mincing of words. L legalism is a dangerous virus within the body of Christ. It is a curse and a stumbling block to those who would seek to obtain righteousness through their own merit or performance. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, let there be no misunderstanding that legalism is a construct. It is a construct of religion and humanism. You see, legalism constructs salvation as a mixture of faith and works, or a synergy of faith and works. 
or in other words, legalism simply portends that God plus man equals salvation. However, the scriptures are very, very clear that it is only through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and through his finished work and through the merit of his sacrifice and atonement that we can be brought into a right relationship with our God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, anyone, you, me, Anyone who looks outside of the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, anyone who places any merit or worth in their own works of righteousness, performance, or merit in order to be justified, in order to be sanctified, or in order to be eternally secure is crafty the dangerous phenomenon of legalism. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if you are trusting in your own performance, in your own works, in addition to what Jesus has already done and finished, you, me, whoever it is, is a legalist. You see, like the inhabitants of Babel, many believers today are quite confused. And they're confused because of the encroachment of legalism within the body of Christ. You see, ladies and gentlemen, legalism is like an unruly vine. When it grows, it wraps itself around everything in its path. And so legalism, ladies and gentlemen, must be cut back. It must be kept in check. It must be kept under control. It must be identified and called for what it is. Ladies and gentlemen, legalism is righteousness through works, righteousness through human merit. And ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that Jesus Christ alone is the righteousness of God. And we are made the righteousness of God through him. You see, it is interesting that in the last days, even as he tried to do in the very beginning through the descendants of Noah, you see, Satan will again try to establish a stronghold of religion and humanism within the church. I find it quite disheartening that more and more preachers are saying less and less about the blood and the finished work of Christ and are saying more and more about the necessity of believers establishing their own righteousness in order to be saved. Folks, make no mistake about it. Achieving righteousness and salvation through human merit is religious humanism, and it is climbing up some other way. Unlike Noah and the descendants of Seth, Nimrod, like his forerunner, Cain, forsook the right way and embraced religious humanism as a way to get to heaven. The embraced works.
Now, nowhere is it said of Nimrod or the inhabitants of Babel that they ever worshipped God through faith in the blood atonement. This is very, very telling, ladies and gentlemen, because where there is no faith in the blood atonement, there is no remission of sins. There is no forgiveness. There is no justification. There is no sanctification. And there is no preservation, ladies and gentlemen. No matter how hard you work to build your own tower, to make yourself a name, ladies and gentlemen, it is only through Jesus Christ and Him alone that you and I can have eternal life. You see, Nimrod tried to establish his own righteousness. And by doing so, he did not submit himself to the righteousness of God. Ladies and gentlemen, when we go about trying to establish our own righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 10. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to Every one that believeth. You see, in building the tower, the citizens of Babel attempted to reach heaven through their own works. However, brick for stone and slime for mortar demonstrate or illustrate the inadequate and inferior substitution of their works in the place of a genuine faith and trust in the blood atonement. Nimrod lived in a temporary city that was built by man works, but ultimately was rejected by God. On the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, Abraham, the father of faith, the Bible says that Abraham looked for a city. Abraham looked for a city, an eternal city that had foundations whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a city that was not only built, but also blessed by God Almighty. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm looking for that city. I'm not trying to build it myself. I'm not trying to climb up some other way. I'm not trying to attain righteousness or attain holiness or attain my own, the preservation of my own salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, the onus is not upon me to accomplish these things. But ladies and gentlemen, it is on our God who through Jesus Christ has already made us the wisdom, the redemption, the sanctification, and the, the righteousness of God. I find it refreshing that man will build nothing in heaven. Man will build nothing in heaven. <laughs> Therefore, he will not be able to boast in anything of himself. You see, in heaven, all of our boasting will be in that which God himself has wrought through his Son, Jesus Christ. It 
is finished. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, or condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-29 John 19 and 30 says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Brothers and sisters, we conclude this series of webinars of Fallen from Grace with the most powerful and the most meaningful illustration of salvation through grace alone found anywhere in the New Testament. You see, it is embodied in the two elements that comprise the Lord's Supper, commonly called the Holy Communion or the Eucharist. You see, Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table to be a memorial service commemorating his redemptive work on the cross. Folks, unlike today, in Paul's day, the Lord's Supper did not consist of a small cracker and a tiny glass of grape juice administered during a worship service. You see, at the church in Corinth, apparently the Lord's Supper was celebrated with a complete meal including food and wine. However, in Paul's day, the true meaning and the true spiritual significance of the Lord's Supper was in jeopardy of being lost. At Corinth, the communion service became disorderly. Some were hungry and sober, while others were stuffed and drunken. The Apostle Paul sought to correct this problem. If these symbolic elements lost their full meaning in Paul's day, without proper teaching, could it not also happen today? You see, it is the attitude of the believer's heart and mind while partaking in the Lord's Supper that the Apostle Paul 
is primarily concerned. Paul warns believers against the profane practice of partaking without discernment, partaking without understanding, partaking without knowledge, partaking without discerning the Lord's body. You see, this could mean that believers are to be discerning of the needs of others in the body of Christ. And I certainly believe that this is an element of the Lord's Supper. But it could also mean that believers should be careful to reverence and to distinguish the symbols of the body and blood of Jesus that are present within the common meal that we share. These elements, the bread and the cup, were to be set apart or sanctified in their hearts and minds as holy, as sacred, as special, because they represent something. They represent the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, every time that we eat this bread and drink this cup, ladies and gentlemen, we have a visible representation and a constant reminder that Jesus said it is finished. Why is this important for all believers? You see, ladies and gentlemen, the bread represents the sacrifice of Christ's body in substitution. And the cup represents the shedding of Christ's blood in atonement. These two elements, these two symbols declare from start to finish, Jesus Christ alone is the architect and engineer of our eternal salvation. Even so, how often is the Lord's Supper improperly deployed as a legalistic barometer to measure one's self-righteousness? And at the same time, we lose sight of the true meaning of the bread and the cup. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, when we present communion as a litmus test of righteousness, when we present and set forth the communion as something that we are striving to be worthy of, ladies and gentlemen, we have our own righteousness in view, our own performance in view. And we have lost sight of the meaning, the true meaning of the bread and the cup. And that is, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you. And in these two elements, we have a finished work, the finished work of Christ. And so the true meaning of the bread and the cup is to remember, to remember what Christ accomplished on our behalf not what we have done not what we will do but what christ has already accomplished however 
You see, there is nothing in the elements of the bread and the cup to suggest or remind us of what we have done or what we must do except through faith with thanksgiving we are to discern the true meaning of the bread and the cup to discern the Lord's body that is when partaking in the Lord's Supper we must recognize the person of Christ and assign to his body and to his blood the total value of their worth. You see, each time the believer partakes of the bread and the cup, it is a visible and consistent reminder that Jesus paid the price for the believer's salvation in full with his own blood, Hebrews 9.12 each time the believer partakes of the bread and the cup, he is declaring that Jesus alone is the author and the finisher of his faith. Each time the believer partakes of the bread and the cup, it is to show or openly acknowledge and confess the merit of Christ's death and his finished work at Calvary, 1 Corinthians 11. 26. Each time the believer partakes of the bread and the cup, it is to remind the believer that he is enjoined to a New Testament, a new covenant that is based on grace, God's unmerited favor, and not on the works or the performance of or the obedience of the law, Matthew 26, 28. Folks, when understood in the light of God's grace and the finished work of the cross, the symbolic meaning or the symbolic representation of the bread and the cup deal a fatal blow to legalism and the concept of salvation and righteousness through human merit. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And so to partake in this manner is to acknowledge that we are therefore saved and also secure in our salvation because Jesus paid the price of our salvation in full. To tell us die, it is finished or paid in full, and he obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9 12 reads, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. The believer can do nothing else through human merit, through his performance, through her works to augment or supplement Christ's finished work. We are to do this till he comes. It is on this basis that believers are admonished but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Folks, on what basis does one become? worthy to partake of that bread and cup. 
You see, the answer to this question lies again in what we call the vantage point of interpretation. You see, we either approach the table of the Lord either from Sinai or from Calvary. When we approach the Lord's table from the vantage point of Sinai and the basis of our own righteousness, folks, none of us are worthy. However, when we approach the Lord's table from the vantage point of Calvary and the finished work of Christ, we understand that it is by grace that we are partakers of the virtue and merit of his broken body and shed blood. With this attitude, and in this manner, we are worthy. Search your heart, if you will. Confess your sin and repent, if you will. However, do not look to your own righteousness or merit when you partake of the bread and the cup. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, Even as in Paul's day and throughout the centuries since, there will always be those among us who will stubbornly cling to their fig leaves, to the fruit of the ground, to brick and slime, etc. These represent the self-righteous works of their own hands, human merit. However, they seem to forget or ignore the facts. From the Garden of Eden to the altar of Abel. From Mount Moriah to the doorposts of Egypt. From the tabernacle in the wilderness to Mount Calvary. From the millennial kingdom to the eternal age. The principles of substitution and atonement are clearly present. You see, the everlasting gospel is without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. You see, these will forever remain con constant and consistent landmarks to the believer of the everlasting gospel. That is, it is only through faith in the finished work and the merit of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that we will inherit the promise throughout the Bible, my brothers and my sisters, in closing. There is one promise that is ever consistent and ever true and that is when I see the blood I will pass over you Lord Jesus I confess openly that I am a sinner. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening tonight and if you have never received Christ into your life as Savior, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. 
And it is not the saying of this prayer that will give you eternal life, but it is simply putting your trust in Christ, believing in your heart that he is the Son of God, that he died for your sin, that you are a sinner on your way to perdition without his saving grace. I invite you to say these words with me, either aloud or in your heart. Lord Jesus, I confess openly that I am a sinner. Thank you for dying upon the cross in my place. I acknowledge that it is only through faith in your shed blood that my sins are forgiven. My name is in the Lamb's book of life and my salvation is secure. I acknowledge that I can do nothing of merit for my salvation, nor maintain my salvation through any works of righteousness of my own. It is a gift of your grace alone. Lord, I pray for myself for the body of Christ and for all who will come to trust you as Savior, that the veil of legalism and righteousness through human merit may be removed from our eyes. That we may understand the righteousness of God can only be received by trusting in your blood and the finished work of Calvary. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, I leave you with one final verse of scripture found in Isaiah 54 and 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. And for those of you that have been with us from the very first chapter of Fallen from Grace, we salute you for your dedication, your faithfulness to these webinars. And we certainly hope that you will continue with us as we present the Grace Theology Institute uh, to the world. And for inquiries, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to contact uh, me, the author, uh, you may do so at the following email address, and that is admin at www.fallenfromgrace.org. Dear friends and guests, this ministry operates on the faith and faithfulness of God's people. If this webinar has been a blessing to you, your gift will help us to reach others with the message of grace and the finished work of the cross. You may visit our website and select the PayPal donation button. Our website is www.gracestudyhour.org. We want to thank you for your prayers. We want to thank you for your support. And as always, until next time, 
May God's grace ever abound toward you. We're going to leave this up for just a couple of minutes. And if you have questions or comments about today's lesson, today's webinar, uh, please enter them into the chat box at this time. And we will be happy to take your questions and comments.